So this is part two of decolonization in Asia. So last time we talked about decolonization in South Asia, now we're going to move over west to Southwest Asia. Um, so just like we did in our last lecture, we're going to start with around the beginning of the time period of period six, just after World War I with the Treaty of Versailles. Now, bef right before that, uh, most of this region was controlled by the incredible shrinking Ottoman Empire. But when the Ottomans lost World War I at the Paris Peace Conference at the Treaty of Versailles, they decided they were going to punish the people who lost the war, which is the Ottoman Empire, and were going to divide up their region, shatter it, and divide it up into new states. Um, but the West believes that these new countries that are going to be formed out of the Ottoman Empire that you see in purple on this map, they don't believe that they are quite capable enough to actually go from a part of the Ottoman Empire to fully independent states. So we get this thing called the mandate system. Now we've talked about this before. The mandate system really just means colonies. So the British, even though they say to the people of Iraq that we see in this picture that they're going to have their own country, they say, well, at some point in the future. But until then, we're going to shepherd you or um, guide you on the path to independence. And so you'll be our mandate until that time occurs where you can be independent on your own. Really, it's just imperialism all over again, just with a different name. So the British are going to control a big part of this area that was the Ottoman Empire. So we see on the left, we see the Ottoman Empire in purple, and on the right, we see that uh, the new state of Turkey has been formed, um, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, etc. So all of these new states are going to come into existence, and each one of them, <coughs> for the most part, are going to be controlled by the British. <coughs> Sorry, so let's do a couple of, let's do one of these states as a case study, Turkey. Turkey used to be um, the heartland of the Ottoman Empire. And so in pre-World War I, it was, it was the Ottoman Empire, but as we talked about on the last slide, it was the incredibly shrinking Ottoman Empire. It was known as the sick man of Europe, and so Turkey was disintegrating. So when they, um, when they were shrinking, when they were declining, we had talked in period five how the Ottoman Empire had tried to pass all these reforms to be like the West, to have enlightenment ideas, to industrialize. And so this is just in terms of review to help you remember period five. And they had the Tanzimat reforms and the Young Turk movement. Um, and those were all reforms to try to fix the Ottoman Empire before they fell apart. They weren't that successful. Um, and so as we just said, when World War I happens and the Ottoman Empire loses, um, Turkey is going to be taken apart from the Ottoman Empire and created as a new state. Now, uh, the, the key figure in Turkey who is going to be there right at the beginning is a guy by the name of Mustafa Kemal um, Ataturk. And you see his picture on the bottom right-hand corner. And if you look at his picture, you can see that he's Western. And so Ataturk believes that the only way that Turkey will ever emerge as a strong state and be able to throw off the yoke of European oppression um, oppression is to westernize, to copy the West. And so we see this as a continuity from period five to period six. Whether it's the Tanzimats, the Young Turks, or Ataturk, um, there's always this idea that we are going to modernize the army or the air forces you see in this picture. We're going to industrialize. We're going to copy the West. That's the only way to beat the West. If you can't beat them, join them. So Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in 1923 starts to modernize Turkey. Even today, Turkey is one of the most Western modernized Muslim countries in the world. And that goes back a large degree to the reforms of Ataturk. And so here we see him not in his military uniform, but in his Western political kind of uniform, as it were. And so here are some of the reforms he's going to undertake to Westernize Turkey. Um, he's going to secularize the state, which means that he's going to separate um, mosque and state. Uh, this is a very Western idea, the separation of church and state. And so we are going to have the political side of things, and we're going to have a religious side of things. And we're not going to have Sharia law. Very Western. Um, and next he says, I'm going to give women the right to vote. If you remember in the United States and Europe after World War I, women were getting the right to vote there. And he says, we need to copy the West. And so he's going to give women the right to vote. And this is in a Muslim country that's very patriarchal, so pretty drastic reform. Next, government sponsorship of industry. So to some degree, like Japan back in period five during the Meiji Restoration, we're seeing that the government is going to help business get started. They're going to protect them. They're going to raise tariffs. Um, they're going to build up infrastructure. And they're going to give all kinds of money to private industries so that they can get started and, and grow what he believes is the only way Turkey can actually industrialize is if you have a strong government sponsoring um, industry. And then we're going to see Western law and clothing. Again, no Sharia law. He's going to encourage people to dress like Westerners so that if we, if we dress Western, we are Western and we'll be successful. 
So Turkey is a very westward looking country. So we see that, you know, we won't really talk about Turkey in the 1920s and 30s and even during World War II, but well, then we will come back to Turkey now. So we know that Turkey is westernized um, and they're not going to play a huge part in World War II, but during the Cold War, they are going to be caught up in the whole Cold War, which side are you on? And Turkey, since they're so westward looking, they're going to join NATO. They're going to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is led by the United States because Turkey doesn't want to become communist. I know their flag is red here, but they don't want to become communist. Uh, and so they're a democracy, they believe in the, like the West, um, and so they're gonna join the alliance system of the West and the military organization, and so that's how they're gonna spend their Cold War time as part of an ally of the United States. Now, if we go to modern times, here we see a map of the EU, the European Union, and you notice that Turkey is not in it. Turkey wants to join the EU. They want to be part of the West ever since Ataturk. Um, and so we see that they have to convince the rest of Europe that they truly are democratic, that they're not radical Muslim, um, that they're going to be good for the EU. And this is something where Turkey is still kind of hanging out. Um, the European Union, we talked about in previous lectures, they're very nervous about Muslim immigration into their countries, and so they're very hesitant to allow a Muslim state, Turkey, to join the EU, because if that happens, then borders drop if you're in the EU and people can move back and forth between the two countries. There's no border stopping you anymore once you're in the EU. And so France, Germany, etc., they're concerned that if they let Turkey into the European Union, it may mean just a huge flood of Muslims coming into Europe. In addition to that, Turkey's economy isn't as good as the EU would like, and so they are afraid that Turkey coming into the EU will drag the whole system's economy down. So there's many issues that are still going on with Turkey today. So the next area we're going to focus on is something that's in the news all the time, Palestine. So Palestine, you can see in the arrow here, it is pointing to this thin strip of land that most people will call Israel today. Um, but let's start off with, again, the beginning of the time period, and this was part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it was one of the provinces controlled by the Ottomans. Now, that's pre-World War I, but of course, after World War I, this is going to get divided up into a mandate, and the British are going to control this region of Palestine. So the British are actually going to be in control of this region, just like they were in control of Turkey and, other, and Iraq and other places. So in 1917, right before the Treaty of Versailles is signed, we see this thing called the Balfour Declaration. It says that the British government agrees, since they're going to be in charge of Palestine, that Jewish people all around the world will be allowed to migrate to Palestine. According to Jewish tradition, it is the Promised Land, the Holy Land of Jews, and they haven't been there since the Romans kicked them out, really, um, in 70 AD, way back in period two. And so we're going to see large amounts of migration of Jews from England, from Europe, from the United States, coming into this small region um, known as Palestine and settling there. And so this is an example of Jewish nationalism, Zionism. However, so many Jewish people come in to the region that the Arabs in the region who were living there, they get a little nervous, they get upset that all of these Jews are coming in, it's changing their culture. We've already talked about what immigration sometimes does. It creates a backlash where people don't want them in. And so now there starts to be some fighting between the Arabs in the region and all of these Jewish immigrants. And so what the British do is they say, look, we're gonna limit it, we cut it off. So the British limit Jewish immigration. It only lasted a few years. And the British say, no, we don't need this headache. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the British don't let hardly any Jews go to Palestine because they have their own problems. They're recovering from World War I, they've got the Great Depression, they're getting ready for World War II, um, and they just don't want to have to send troops to Palestine to, you know, to separate these two groups, Jews and Arabs, and so they say our solution is just not to let any more Jews in which of course has dire consequences. As many Jews are being persecuted at the beginning of the Holocaust, they would like to leave Europe, they would love to go to Palestine, to the homeland, um, but the British won't let them go. Um, and so we see that a lot of these Jews will end up dying in the Holocaust. Now, after World War II, <laughs> the world finds out about the Holocaust, or the the, made, the people of the world, and the leaders knew. But um, and so we see that there's this tremendous outpouring that we need to have a place where Jews can go where they won't be killed anymore. If you remember, after World War II, the United States and the West creates all of these institutions like the UN to try to avoid future Holocaust and future wars. And so to that end, one of the first things the United Nations does is it, the British give them the mandate of Palestine, and the UN will now 
partition the country. They will divide it up into two states. We will have an Arab state of Palestine, seen here in yellow, um, and that will be for the Arabs that live in the region. And then we're going to have a Jewish state, <coughs> excuse me, known as Israel. And this will be a homeland for the Jews. And the thinking goes that if the Jews have a homeland, maybe we can avoid another Holocaust. And so in 1948, the UN creates the partition. <coughs> Sorry, got a cough the partition of Israel. And we see these weird borders because it's trying to go along kind of ethnic lines where people have settled. But as soon as Israel becomes a state, all the Arab nations around it, and I do mean all of them in this picture, they're going to attack Israel as soon as it becomes a country. Brand new baby country, bam, attacked by all of its neighbors. They do this because the Arabs believe that this is just another form of European imperialism. Most of the Jews that are coming in to live in Israel are from Europe and the United States, the West. And so they see just at the moment of time where the world is getting rid of decolonization after World War II, where they want to get rid of these Europeans, here come more Europeans to settle into Israel. Um, and so that's why they attack. Now, not only does Israel stop this attack from all of its neighbors, but it pushes them back. And the war, when the war is over, <coughs> I'm sorry, Israel has not only survived, but they have taken all of the land that you see in yellow. And so now Jews in Israel control a, a pretty large number of Arabs that were formerly known as Palestinians. And so we see Israel has gotten bigger in size. And if we were to go from then till today, we see a series of wars between Israel and its neighbors, uh, a whole series of wars, Yom Kippur War, Seven Days War, etc., as they <coughs> try to wipe Israel off the face of the planet. I'm so sorry. So today what we see <coughs> is the Arabs who are living in Israel, they are controlled by a Jewish government and they don't like this. And so we see Palestinian nationalism. They want their country to be ruled by Palestinians without Israeli control. And in fact, they want to go beyond that. They want to wipe all of Israel off the map. They want to get rid of all the Jews in the region. And so we see terrorist organizations known as the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, and they every so often will launch terrorist attacks against the Israelis, um, try to take some people hostage, the Israelis retaliate, and so this has been going on really ever since 1948. One of the uprisings is called the Infitata. Infitata. Anyway, and so we see that they, the conflict and the ethnic and religious violence in the region still continues even to today. Next up, we're going to do a case study of Egypt, just like we've done Turkey and we've done Israel. Now let's talk about Egypt, and you were doing Egypt for a different reason. Egypt, as we remember, used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, but then it kind of got its semi-independent status, and then eventually got taken over by the, by the British, even before World War I. Um, and so the Egyptians, after World War II, they certainly, like the rest of the Arab world, they want to get rid of Europeans, and so we see Egypt as its own country, and it has this leader named Abdul Nasser, and we see him pictured in the top right. Now, he has a dream for not just Egypt to be a strong country, but he wants all Arab Muslim countries in the region to band together um, during the Cold War so they cannot be controlled by the Soviet Union or the United States, that they will be their own kind of third superpower. And so this is called pan-Arab nationalism. That's Abdul Nasser's big goal, is to unite all of the Arabs in the region that we see in this picture here um, into one, if not country, at least one super tight coalition of allies where they control a lot of oil, where they control the region, they control the Sinai Peninsula, hopefully, um, and they are able to stand up against the Soviets in the United States and be just like India and non-aligned. Now, this doesn't go anywhere um, because, uh, you know, it's, Abdul Nasser, he goes to Syria and says, why don't you join my pan-Arab nationalism? And Syria says, that sounds great. Who's going to be in charge in this? And Abdul Nasser says, well, you follow me. And the Syrians say, no, I'm gonna, we're not going to follow you. Iraq says the same thing, so does Saudi Arabia. And so we see that these ethnic differences between Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, they just become too much to, too much to overcome. And so Abdul Nasser's dream of pan-Arab nationalism doesn't go anywhere because it has to overcome all of these ethnic differences. He also, of course, wants Egypt to be industrial, and so he promotes economic development, just like we saw with Ataturk much earlier um, in time, but also this uh, struggle somewhat because they're just trying to go up against the Western juggernaut, the Western power that has already industrialized. Then we're going to see that Abdel Nasser tries to stand up to the West, and he 
Um, what he does is he takes over the Suez Canal. Now that was part of a, that was a British canal, um, and he believes it's in Egypt. It should be controlled by the Egyptians' nationalism, and so he takes it over. The British and the French try to take it back. Um, it becomes a, a big crisis in the Cold War. So just we'll cut to the chase. The United States, trying to avoid World War, World War III, makes the English and the French just get out of Egypt and leave it to the Egyptians. And so we see that to some extent, Abdel Nasser uh, is able to kind of play this non-aligned game, um, keeping his territory, becoming kind of a hero to the Arabs in the region because he stood up to the West, but he's never able to actually create pan-Arab nationalism. Then the last thing we have on this slide for Egypt is, now Egypt and Israel, uh, they have attacked Israel in the past, I had talked about on the previous slide, but in the 1970s, Egypt becomes the first Arab country in the region, the first Muslim country in the region, to make peace with Israel. Um, the United States is, is important in this process. These are called the Camp David Accords, and at least between two countries in the Middle East, we have some peace. Egypt and Israel, they're not friends exactly, but they're not going to attack each other. Um, that did not catch on to the other countries in the region, but we will see that there is a little bit of peace in the Middle East, at least between these two uh, countries, uh, Israel being a Jewish state and Egypt being a Muslim state. Next we have Iraq. And Iraq, of course, this has been a lot in the news for years now with the United States. But Iraq, just like the rest of the countries, were part of the Ottoman Empire. And when World War I is over, it's going to be a British mandate for a while. Um, now, the British helped draw the boundaries of Iraq. They didn't ask the people in Iraq where they wanted the boundaries. In fact, there's lots of different ethnic groups in Iraq um, and different religious groups. And so Iraq is kind of created um, according to European map makers. And so the British are going to use Iraq as a mandate for its oil to help rebuild their economy between World War I and World War II. After World War II, like in many places around the world, we see decolonization. The British are too broke, too busted up to continue control their colonies and their mandates. And so Iraq becomes an independent state after World War II. Now, the country has three ethnic groups or religious groups. In the north, we have these group of people called the Kurds. The Kurds are Sunni Muslim, um, which means they're like most Muslims, but they're a different ethnic group than most of the other people in the region. They speak a different language. They have different traditions. Then we see a group of Sunnis kind of in the middle, and these are Sunnis just like you would find in Syria, just like you would find in Jordan, just like you would find in Saudi Arabia, and they are Arab ethnically, so they're different than the Kurds because they have a different ethnic group, not a different religion. And in the bottom of the country, we see the Shia. Now, if you remember, Shia are Muslim, but they are a different branch of Islam, a different sect. And so we see that Iraq is divided up big picture among these three different groups, and religion divides them or ethnicity divides them, and they don't want to live together at all. But when Europe drew the boundaries, they didn't ask the people who were living there if it should be one country. And so between the 1980s and the 1990s, all of these three groups are held together by a ruthless dictator named Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, um, he, it, it's an oil-rich country, and he has a dream of not necessarily have pan-Arab nationalism, but he wants to take over the whole region just militarily and then control the world's oil. Because this region, the Persian Gulf, um, which is where a lot of the world's oil comes from. And he says, if I can take over Iraq and then Kuwait and then Saudi Arabia, maybe Iran someday, I would control most of the world's oil and I would be the most powerful man on earth. And so that's Saddam Hussein's dream. And he's able to keep the Kurds and the Sunni and the Shia together in one country just by brutal dictatorial force. So every so often we'll see the Kurds, they will rebel because they don't want to be under Saddam Hussein, who is a Sunni. Um, his control, and so he will actually um, use chemical weapons against his own people, as we see in the picture here, a very gruesome picture, and he will gas some of his own people. So this is just an example of his brutal methods to keep um, the Iraqi state whole together. Then he's going to fight a 10-year war against the Iranians in the 1980s. And again, I, I told you it was part of his plan to control the entire region's oil. It's a really long war. The United States is going to sell weapons actually to both sides at different points in the war. Um, but this is an example of the Cold War. He's going to get some support from the United States. He's going to get some support from the Russians. Um, and he does it all to try to um, fight his neighbors, the Iranians. Eventually, though, after the Cold War is over, um, we see that the United States is the only superpower, um, and Saddam Hussein, he is going to invade Kuwait. 
as part of his plan that I talked about that he's trying to control most of the oil in the region. And so the United States, who's heavily dependent on Saudi Arabian oil, which is the bottom picture in the map, the bottom country in the map, um, and Kuwait, which is right next to the word Sharia on the bottom right map. It's that tiny little kind of triangular country. Um, we are going to fight two wars against Saddam Hussein. One, to liberate Kuwait because the Iraqis come and invade the region, and two, to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And so the United States, around the turn of the millennia, around the 2000s, will have fought two wars in Iraq. And so the United States, what we'll do is we'll end our story with the United States um, coming into the region, trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein, which they do, and then the United States is trying to keep Iraq together. They don't want it to split apart into a whole bunch of different parts. And so the United States has had a tough time trying to figure out when to pull out of Iraq. Because as soon as we do, of course, all the different ethnic and religious groups want to fragment and go their separate ways. And this will destabilize the whole region, maybe lead to a wider war. Um, and so the United States is struggling to try to keep this country together. Um, but without using violence, because the more violence we use, the more terrorism results. Um, and so it's a difficult situation. We'll see what happens in the future. So Iran. Iran is the country that we had just talked about having in a war with Iraq, and the United States has a long history in Iran. Post-World War II, um, Iran is a brand new country, um, and they have a lot of oil, and the United States needs oil. And so what we'll do is the United States will overthrow the government of Iran um, because they were leaning communists during the Cold War. Um, and so in 1953, we engineer a coup, a violent government overthrow, and we place the Shah of Iran as the king of Iran. Shah means king in Persian. And so there he is. If you notice this picture, he and his wife, they look very Western. They're very pro-US. And so the United States is able to not use him as a puppet ruler, but pretty close. Right? We have, we put him in charge and he is very pro-US. And we do this because we need his oil. Then in the 1970s, there is a growing movement throughout the Middle East called Islamic fundamentalism. We see it in other countries, but I'm just going to focus on it here. Islamic fundamentalism is the idea that uh, it's during the Cold War, and they're very upset about the United States uh, in Iraq. They're upset about the United States in Iran. They're upset about the United States' support of Israel. Um, and so they see that the United States is too much, and the West, Europe, is too much in their region. And so this is nationalism. We want Muslims to be in charge of the Middle Middle East and not Westerners. And so what is a way that you can say that you are not the West, that you're rejecting the West? Well, you reject Western culture and dress and governments and economy and become fundamentalists. Go back to the past. What's a way we can show that we are nationalists? Well, we will um, wear traditional clothing. And so in 1979, we see this man here named the Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah is a religious title. He's a, he's a Muslim scholar, he's a, he's, a, he's a teacher, that kind of thing. Um, he's a religious leader, and he is going to engineer the overthrow of the, of the Shah of Iran, the guy the United States put in charge many years before. Um, so we'll see that now we see a trend happening in the Middle East from 1979 on, is that we're going to see one country after another become much more fundamentalist, much more anti-US, anti-West, um, and because they believe the United States is too much in their business, too much in their region. So growing anti-Westernization happens, or fundamentalism. And so we see lots of anti-US demonstrations at this time. Now, today we have, so we'll go up right up to today, the, the Iranians are trying to develop a nuclear program. They say it's for energy, although we're an oil-rich country, um, and so the United States fears that they want to build a nuclear program, not for energy, but actually for bombs and weapons. And what would happen if these fundamentalist people who hate the United States have atomic weapons? And so the United States has been for a long time trying to punish the Iranians for isolating them, embargoing them for having a, a nuclear weapons program. Just recently, President Obama um, had said it's okay if the Iranians have a nuclear program as long as they don't make weapons, they just make it for energy. And so we'll see this, this uh, situation is fluid and it uh, is ongoing. So then we have Afghanistan. We're almost done with this section. Afghanistan is either in Southwest Asia or Central Asia, depending on how you want to classify it. And in the 1980s, during the Cold War, the Soviets invade Afghanistan. Now, the reasons for this invasion are somewhat unclear. Perhaps they were trying to get closer to Iran and the oil fields. The Soviet Union needs oil. Perhaps they were just trying to exert their influence in the region. We're not exactly sure, but the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan in 1979. And they'll stay there for a good long time. It's kind of like their Vietnam. It 
becomes one of these proxy wars. The Soviet Union, we see them here invading Afghanistan, and then now the United States will sell weapons to the Mujahideen. Um, these are people who are going to, they're Muslim, they're fundamentalist, and instead of being anti-U.S. in Afghanistan, they're pro-U.S. because the U.S. is giving them weapons to kill the Soviets. So I know it seems like the sides are flip-flopping here a little bit. In Afghanistan, they are, because the Soviets are coming in as the invaders, and so it's a proxy war. We're giving weapons to the Afghanis so that they can kill the Soviets. So it's certainly part an example of the Cold War. The Taliban will eventually win, and they'll kick out the Soviet Union, and then they will establish an Islamic fundamentalist state with Sharia law. Very conservative. And even though the United States gave them support in, in, during the Afghan war, during the Cold War, they're going to be very anti-U.S. after the war is over. Again, because they think that the West um, is too much in control of the region, even though we helped them out. Um, and so we see that the Taliban is going to give safe haven to a terrorist named Osama bin Laden. Um, he is a Saudi Arabian who is going to flee to Afghanistan and he is a very rich man and he is going to fund terrorism from Afghanistan including um, the attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001 um, where the Twin Towers and the Pentagon are attacked um, as well as other targets. And so we see that the United States is going to be angry with Afghanistan because um, they gave uh, Osama bin Laden a safe place to stay and to carry out these attacks. And so the United States will invade Afghanistan. Um, and we still see the United States involved in the region to some extent even today. So when we come back, we'll do our next set of notes on China in uh, the 20th century.